What's up, everybody? My name is Patrick Jones, and I'm the host of the Patrick Jones Baseball Podcast. On this episode, we have Doug Lauman. Doug has over 40 years of scouting experience with several major league organizations. Um, he's been a scouting director. He's been area scout. He's been a bird dog. He has done it all. And in this episode, he uh, lets us peek behind the curtain a little bit. He lets us um, in on on just how they go about scouting, um, what it's like scouting players down in the Dominican Republic versus scouting players in America, what he's looking for when he's out scouting and how he only really needs to see a player one time before he's in or out on, on them. So it's pretty fascinating stuff. I love listening to, to someone like Doug who has been doing something for over 40 years, much less something in baseball, which I personally love in scouting. Uh, so I, I loved it. I could have gone on forever and ever, but uh, so if you're someone who, uh, is curious about the scouting world. If you're someone who maybe wants to know, hey, what are they looking for when they're going out and watching players? Or maybe you're just curious on on what it's like to to go and evaluate and and what it's like looking at players down the Dominican Republic versus in the United States and and all these different elements that go into it. And you know, scouting high school players and and he, Doug said he he has scouted 10 Hall of Famers when they were in high school. And he has a great Derek Jeter story that he tells as well. So ton, ton of great information, great content. Appreciate Doug for coming on the show today. Um, if you have not already, I don't know why not, but please head to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and, and write a short review for us. Um, that's how more and more people are going to be able to find out more about the show. And, and we want to be able to, to get this thing into as many people's ears as possible. So head to iTunes, leave us a five-star rating and, and write a short review. And I hope you enjoy this episode with Doug Lauman. All right, Doug. Well, I appreciate it so much for for you coming on the podcast today. Uh, I'm excited to to pick your brain on a lot of different topics. Okay. Well, I hope I can be of some assistance or <laughs> yeah, let you gain a little bit of knowledge. But uh, you know, my field's so specific that we'll just see how it works out. So you've been scouting now for for over forty years, and my question to you, my first question, just to to start it off, if you could go back in time over 40 years ago and you could give yourself one piece of advice in your first year of scouting with everything that you now know what would you tell yourself in your first year what piece of advice would you give yourself wow that's a great question um i guess is to always expect the unexpected um you know there's times when uh, again, I, we won't keep referring to over the 40 years, but there are times when you expect to go to a game, you've heard so much, you, you've read so much, and you start to expect what you're going to see, and you don't see it. Uh, you're, you're let down, perhaps, and at the same time, uh, you go somewhere and you're really not expecting to see a whole lot, and, and you see something you really like. Um, so you have to temper your expectations a little bit. Just go with an open, free mind. Um, view what it is you need to view. You know, remain diligent to your ideas and to what you think you need to see and what you want to see. And then uh, evaluate the player on what it is you happen to see that day. So I would say just just to remain open-minded and, and keep an open mind as to what you're going to go look at. When you say uh, just keep an open mind, are you referring to when you go and, and scout a player and then when you come back and scout them again is to not show up that second time with already knowing what you're going to probably see again? Is that what you mean? Well, not, not, not necessarily. Okay. I, I think I mean more, uh, what it is you're going to see the first time, uh, you know, you hear, you talk to other scouts, you talk to 
you know, coaches, family members, people in the media, and they tell you one thing. And, and, and so you paint a picture in your mind of what you're going to see and you get there and you don't see the same thing. Um, you know, it, it's not a bad idea, like you say, to, to remember the second time when you go back, not to fall into a, a, a rut of either not letting go of what you saw the first time or not accepting what you see the second time. Um, typically, uh, Pat, I can tell you that my opinion very rarely changes on a player after I see him the first time. Um, and, and maybe it, maybe if you asked me 30, 25, 30, 35 years ago, it would have been different. But um, a lot of people scout different ways. Uh, some people strictly scout on physical tools, um, makeup, attitudes, aggressiveness, different things like that. I'm kind of a gut feel scout. Um, you know, there's been times before when I've walked into a ballpark, uh, whether it's a high school or college um, facility to see a kid or work at a game. And before a kid even picks up a bat or a ball, just the way his body language, just the way he walks around, you know, it, it, we refer to their gait a lot, gait meaning their stride or the way they might run or you watch them warm up and their flexibility and different things like that. That all means a lot to me. Um, you know, you've heard all the war stories, I'm sure, and, and a lot of people have as well. Typically, now, when you're an area scout, you can go see a kid play several times. You, you know, you might get to know him as a sophomore, junior, senior, three times a year. You might get 10 games on him. But the people that are making the decisions on that player typically aren't going to see them more than one time. And it's going to be their senior year. And if they're the best player on the team, they're typically not getting pitched to. Uh, the kid gets anxious. He starts swinging the balls out of the strike zone because he wants to do something. He knows there's people there to see him or they just walk him. So there's a lot of things you have to go on by gut and by instinct because you just don't get to see the physical performance all the time. And, and you know, that's not to say a kid might pop up twice and strike out. Uh, you know, and then you got to decide whether you're going to take him in the first round and give him, you know, what used to be a couple hundred thousand now is, you know, five, six, seven million dollars. So uh, th there's a lot to having good area scouts, good scouts that know backgrounds on players that you have to trust and that you can rely on to tell you because you're not always going to see it the first time you go to see it. That's so, that's so interesting. I think that, you know, that you say, you know, you really don't change your opinion on a player after really only seeing them one time. I'm sure a big part of that is just, you've been, you know, you have so much experience and uh, you know, that, you know, that helps so much. I know for me, I mean, I'm, I know I've, you know, just in coaching, you start projecting different players there's been players that I didn't think would, you know, perform at higher levels in the minor leagues and some that did, and it didn't work out. Um, do you attribute that gut feel like to you? Is, is that you just solely get that by experience? Well, I, I think the more experience you have, the better you get. Uh, however, uh, you know, you, you, you look beyond performance, especially, you know, when you're scouting, you look at, Obviously, you look at tools, you know, if a guy can run, throw, hit, hit for power and field. Uh, a lot of those things you can see without performance. Um, now, with performance, it makes it a lot easier. But when I see a kid that has a good swing, you know, the, the swings on a good plane, there's no hitch, there's no uppercut, there's no jumpiness, there's no uh fear of the baseball you know bailing out stepping in the bucket different things like that he shows all the positive traits that a player should show um even though maybe 
again, he wanders and goes out of the strike zone because he doesn't want to walk four times. Uh, you can still tell. Now, again, that's where you rely a little bit on your, your, your area scouts, the guys that know him and say, hey, believe me, I've seen this kid play 20 games. He can hit. He can get the, you know, the barrel to the ball. Um, you know, you have to weigh all those things. So, you know, part of what scouting is all about is the, the chain of command and the ability to, for the guy in the top chair to trust the people that he's working with. Um, you know, I was a scouting director for 14 different drafts. Wow. Uh, I every first rounder I took I saw play. Uh, there was a couple second, third rounders that I didn't get a chance to see. Um, you know, you're trying to cover a whole country, Puerto Rico and Hawaii. And back in the day, the draft was the first week in June, and the weather didn't break until the middle of you know February, sometimes March first. You know, you, you, you're trying to, with the draft was unlimited rounds. It, it was, you could draft 60, 70 rounds. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now it's been reduced to 20, but, um, you know, you see a hundred guys that only going to take you through the first two or three rounds. And you might be wrong on a lot of those 20 in terms of having seen them and they didn't go that high. So there, there's a lot of trust, but like I say, there's, there's so many more tools now. I, I think it makes it easier now because number one, there's the travel ball. Number two, they play year round. Number three, you got all the video in the world. Um, I don't want to be a, you know, a, a guy that sticks my head in the sand, but I'm not a gigantic proponent of, you know, track man and you know exit velocity and launch angle and all that they're all important but i think we've always as scouts we've always seen that we've just not been able to measure it um you know nobody has to tell me what tony Gwynn's or wade boggs or rod carew's that they had a swing angle that was flat. I, I knew that. Now, could I say it was 24 degrees and this and that? No, I couldn't, but you know, I could tell you. So um, again, and it's the same thing with fastballs. You know, you talk about fastballs with pitchers. Why can some guys throw 92, 93 and throw, be a closer and throw it by a hitter? And some guys are 100, 101 and just get hit all over the park. Well, it's got something to do with life. It's got something to do with angle. It's got a lot of different proponents to it. Now, perhaps we're able to measure it because of the equipment, the machines we had. But, you know, I was always able to see a guy throwing 100 to just got blasted all over the ballpark. Something was going on with his fastball. There was a lack of deception, a lack of life. And some guys that would throw in the low 90s and throw it right by people that, that there's something different about it. So I always refer to a, I don't even know what it's called. I think it was called the fastball. It was a 30 minute video that the only place I ever found it for some reason was on an airplane. And they were talking to Hank Aaron and, and a, a lot of the big good hitters. Uh, and they were ranking fastballs, you know, Walter Johnson, you know, Ron Guidry, Randy Johnson, Roger Clemens, and all those guys. And Hank Aaron to this day said that some guys threw fastballs that, that could rise, that would go up. And the people producing and running the show convinced him somehow that it's impossible to make a ball rise. Now, if you throw from a low submarine, three quarters, sure, the ball's still on its way up. But a typical three quarter overhand pitcher, he cannot make the ball rise. You know, what happens is the hitter's eyes pick up the balls at 
they can't watch the ball the whole way. They don't see the ball the whole 60 feet, six inches. They see it when it leaves his hand. They get another, their eye, their, their nerve, their optical nerves can only pick it up at certain points. They might see it 10 feet out of his hand, halfway to the plate and 10 feet before the plate. So they have been trained and they've hit and their eyes anticipate what the ball is going to do. They anticipate the ball is dropping at a 12 degree angle. So when they make their approach and when they start their trigger and their swing, they are anticipating where the ball is going to be when their back gets to the strike zone. Now, some guys' balls, because of now what we're learning with the backspin and the track man and all that, some guys' balls don't sink at that same expected angle, and they stay higher. Um, you know, those are the guys typically you hear people on TV talk about they got great spin rate, they got this, they got that. It's because that ball isn't doing what has been expected for those hitters for the baseball to do over the course of their life. <clears throat> and because Hank Aaron would have certain pitchers that he would always swing under the ball and strike out in his mind and his, you know, his eyes tell him that the ball's going above his bat. So it must be rising when he gets to the plate, whereas it's not really rising. It's just not sinking as much as they typically do. Um, the reason I bring this up because it's important for us to value hitters and, and the game has changed so much. Now hitters can, you know, you can strike out 200 times a year. If you hit 30 or 40 bombs and knock in a hundred, nobody cares. But we talk a lot about in scouting meetings, contact rate. Is this guy a good hitter? Yeah. Does he have a lot of swings and misses? Um, you know, now there's ways to measure. Yeah, he swings and misses, but it's against these guys that have balls that have better spin rates. Uh, so, you know, the world's changing. Um, you know, I'm 64 years old and don't have a whole lot of time left in scouting. Um, and I'm not going to change what I've done for 40 years, but at the same time, I don't want to sit there with my head in the sand and say that this stuff doesn't have some value. But I, I still don't think there's any more value than the guy with experience that can go in and evaluate. Yeah, I, I don't even know where to begin from that. I think that was that might have been the, the best explanation uh, that I've heard in a very long time when just in, in your ability to simplify what it means to for, for that fastball to rise and how it hitters feel like it's rising, but it's actually not. I think that was really well, really well put by you. Um, ha how have you ever drafted a player based on those metrics and went against your gut? Well, have I? No. Have we? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we we haven't past five, six, eight years. We've hired an analytics department. And we have guys that we're paying a lot of money that are very smart people that will argue with you on this guy won't have success because he doesn't have a proper spin rate or his curveball doesn't make him enough revolutions. And that, I mean, I will fight him on the guy if there's two of them and I like one guy better with my eyes and they like the other guy better because of the metrics. Um, I have not won every one of those battles. They've won some of the battles. Um, typically, you'd like to think the people you work with will go with those people who spend 250 nights a year on the road rather than the guy that's sitting at his computer all day <laughs> and not even ever having laid eyes on the, per the person. But I, I, I get it. I mean... Fortunately, usually these numbers match up. If I see a guy that's got a good fastball, I see it because he gets swings and misses. I see it because he can locate. I see it because he can move it up and down in the zone. When you put the numbers on them, they typically show that. 
and the spin rates and the uh, you know the uh, revolutions and stuff all match up. Occasion, excuse me. Occasionally, you get a guy that doesn't. Um, I'm trying to think of a guy we drafted. He was from Moeller, right-handed pitcher, probably. 12, 10, 12, 15 years ago. Big kid through 88 to 90. And he could throw a fastball by anybody in the world. It was straight. It was right down the middle. And people would swing and miss it every time. And to me, that tells me that that was before all these measurements. He probably had unbelievable backspin, unbelievable spin rates on his fastball. Uh, there was a kid from uh, Rice University named Anderson that was a, I think he went 1 1 overall in the draft, Detroit Tigers, 12, 15 years ago. Throw 100, 102 miles an hour, and he couldn't get anybody out. And but when you went to scouting, you recognize that. Now, we were maybe calling it lack of deception, fastball being straight, whereas nowadays they would probably say he had terrible spin rate, no backspin. That's why it was straight. So we saw everything the same. We just couldn't measure it. And now they can measure it. So unfortunately, all that stuff doesn't work all the time either. Um, the, the thing that, that probably irritates me the most about it is when I draft a kid that isn't what I expected him to be, that, that just doesn't have success, you know, I have to own it. People know I took him. People saw that he didn't have success. Um, typically, the analytical guys will find some sort of number that when they're wrong, they'll have a number for it that says they really weren't wrong. And, and I think that bothers me a little bit. Now, I, I apologize if you're a big analytical guy. I, um, if you were on the field, which I know you were, uh, you probably understand both aspects of it. But I just think there needs to be a good mix. I really do. I, I think... You know, there's no reason to hide from technology. There's no reason to hide from all this stuff. But there's so much about the human element. I mean, you just, you know, I, I used to speak at the Sox Fest, which was like, you know, the Reds Caravan, that you know, but they'd have thousands of people uh, in Chicago at the uh, Palmer House or the Hyatt Regency or whatever. And we'd have panels and some people were really nice and complimentary and some people were pain in the ass. And, you know, how come you can't tell a player from a golfer? And I would say there was, the, 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 there was a point in time in my career, the drafts that I ran, I want to say it was about eight consecutive years. On the even number of years, I drafted Chris Sale, Carlos Rodon, Tim Anderson. On the odd years, I drafted Courtney Hawkins um, and two other guys that didn't succeed. So I asked these people in the audience, I said, should they just have me be the scouting director on even number of years and let somebody else do it on odd years? There's just too many variables. Just like you said, you've coached kids that you didn't think would have success that did and, and vice versa. So you can't, you can't take the human element out of this. And, and that's why I think the scouting part, if you're going to try to merge these two things together with analytics and with scouting, the edge should go to the scouting because they see the person, they know the human being, and, and they can make some sort of evaluation on that. Yeah, I think you brought up uh, some really, really good points there, especially when you, you know, we were talking about the, the human element. And I honestly say you, you the most important things you can't quantify. And I know that's really frustrating uh, for organizations because they want to be able to quantify everything. But 
you just can't. I don't know how else to really explain it. It's kind of, you know, from a hitting coach's perspective, you know, the importance of the mental game. How do you really quantify that? I, I don't know how you quantify it, but I know it's more important than probably anything else. And it's what separates hitters. And I think it's kind of similar to what you're saying on the scouting side, where you may not be able to quantify everything, but you know, it's really important because you've been doing it for all these years. You spend over 270 nights on the road doing nothing except watching baseball players. And, you know, and I want to get into this eventually, but I believe we, when we talked on the phone last time, I think you said you've seen 10 hall of famers in high school. So point being is, you know, when you have so much experience, um, I can hundred percent totally understand why uh, the analytics would, would turn you off because it, it, they, it can come across as, as arrogant, right? Like, well, the numbers say X, Y, and Z. When in reality, I think you can manipulate numbers to fit your opinion in pretty much every facet of life, or at least a good part of it anyway. No, yeah, I agree with you 100%. It's, um, I don't want to say it's luck, um, but there's a lot. Um, an old-time scouting director which I guess I am too, but uh, much older than me. He was a scouting director with the Braves, and he was the one responsible for that 13, 14-year run they had of winning their division and all that. Um, probably the most successful scouting director, you know, there ever has been. Um, he took a liking to me the first few years I was scouting um, and was giving me tips, and especially when I became a scouting director. He said to me one time, he said, hey, Doug, he said, you know the difference between your evaluations and my evaluations? And I said, Mr. Snyder, I, I, I don't really know. He said, it's the day you see the player. And, and there's so much truth to that. I mean, it's we can talk about what I talked about earlier with gut instinct, with tools, with you know, projecting and all that, but it's a whole lot easier to go out and see a guy go four for five with two home runs and a double and make a great play in the field and take him in the first round versus a guy that was 0 for four with two punch outs and two pop ups. So, so there is some luck to the time and to the days that you see him. Uh, but, but at some point you have to move beyond that. Uh, but yeah, you can't. Let me put it this way. You mentioned that Hall of Fame thing. There was a kid. Are, are you from the Cincinnati area? Yeah, not? I went to Moeller. I went to Moeller. Okay. You're probably a little bit too young uh, for this. But there was, a, there was a high school shortstop first rounder. Cleveland took him back 25, 30 years ago named Mark Lewis from Hamilton High School. Uh, the same year was Barry Larkin, Moeller. And there was also a kid named Dave Hellman, a Covington Catholic in, in uh, Northern Kentucky. They all came out the same year. Uh, you know, Larkin, to me, was the best player. But Mark Lewis also went in the first round. Just a great player. I mean, he could run, he could throw, he could hit, he had power. Um, around the same time when Derek Jeter was in Michigan. And there's no question in my mind at that time as seniors in high school that Mark Lewis would have more success than Derek Jeter. Now, did I like Derek Jeter? Absolutely. Was he a great athlete? Absolutely. Was he polished in any way, shape, or form? Not at all. Um, we've all heard the stories. He had 56 errors in his rookie year in pro ball. Uh, he didn't have enough strength to hit the ball even up the gap, but he had the ability. He had the natural ability. And as we learn, as we come to see what he's done, I mean, you know, a lot of us have watched that show about him and that, you know, I've watched his career every year since he was a, a junior in high school. He had, you know, he had that it factor. He had the work ethic. He had the ability in his body and his mind to make adjustments and to do the things he had to do. You know, Mark Lewis was traded a couple of times, got a cup of coffee in the big leagues. He's a pretty good player, but didn't 
come out to be any, obviously. I mean, he was never even an all-star, really a, a long-time starter as a player. But, yeah, there's just <laughs> – there's a lot more to it. I, I just – I read an article online the other night, and, and thankfully the article, the guy said he's getting tired of hearing about the 24 teams ahead of the angels that drafted Mike Trout. He said all 24 of those teams should be, the scouting department should have been fired, should have been this, should have been that. Now I never saw Mike Trout in high school. Um, my, my cross checker said, you don't need to see him. He's a third or fourth round pick. He was up in the New Jersey area. We saw him in May. It was a cold, rainy day. He was a thick-bodied kid that was playing shortstop. <clears throat> and he said he's not going to stay at short. He's probably going to have to move somewhere. Um, you know, it was more of a power muscle swing than it was a bat speed swing. And it was late, getting close to the draft. He said, no, don't let somebody else have him. Well, I mean, you know, the rest is history. <laughs> you, you know, I mean, things change. And and for people to criticize you for not taking him, and it, you know, they didn't see him when he was at the same age. The, you know, they, they just don't know. So it's it's a tough business, man. It, it really is. It's hard to, you know, I can go to a college game with my wife and she can tell me who the best player on that team is. But 90% of the time, the best player on the team isn't the best prospect, mm. you know, so. That's important for people who are listening and watching this to, to understand. And I think that's hard for some people because you may think, well, right now, you know, I'm my batting average is higher than, you know, this other guy. Why is he getting all this attention and I'm not? And you just said it to a T. Well, just because he's the best player doesn't mean he's the best prospect. I think yeah. that's something people don't understand. No, they don't. And and I I almost feel bad at times for for uh, parents, maybe especially fathers. You know, you you have a trial camp in your local community, and there's 157 year olds. In all likelihood, not one of those guys, not one of those 170 kids will ever play in the big leagues. A very small percentage of them will even play in high school and even smaller percentage will play in college. Um, you know, and now that the game has become a worldwide game, they're not even just competing against the guys in their community or their city or their state or even in their country now because a lot of the good players are coming from – you know, Asia, and they've always come from Venezuela and Puerto Rico and Dominican, but um, it's tough, you, you know, but it, that's not to say they shouldn't still try to make their kids the best player they can be, because that's all that's really important. Try to be as good as you can be. If you're not as good as Johnny or you're not as good as Jimmy, that's fine, but you're as good as you can be. So continue to work and continue to try. Hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's 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 hard. It's hard. I I want to know how hard, how much harder is it to draft a high school hitter versus a college hitter? Because to me, it seems that it is really risky to take a high school hitter compared to a college guy who has a track record, has is more polished, proven. I get there's more upside maybe to a high school hitter, but man, there's a lot of unknowns. No, I, I, I agree with you. And I've always used it. People, a lot of people in the business will say that about the upside of the high school kid um, hitter. You know, Barry Larkin had some upside. He came out of Michigan. Mark McGuire had some upside. Barry Bonds had some upside. As we're watching right now, Aaron Judge had some upside. And they're all college guys. So I've kind of gotten away from, because I kind of felt that way too. And that's where I've evolved a little bit. Um, college hitters are pretty good and they remain good and they get better. Um, 
I think the evaluation comes more from the quality of pitching that they that they see. Um, you know, in high school, you might play one game a week where you see a guy thrown in the low mid eighties. You know, in college, you see them typically, you know, throwing middle upper eighties and low mid nineties. Um, so the, the quality of pitching that a guy faces, one thing we do, Pat, that I, I know everybody else does, so it's nothing revealing, is you can get splits now on guys by days of the week. And we'll oftentimes find a college hitter that on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Sundays, he's hitting 450 and got 12 home runs. But on Fridays and Saturdays, when they're playing conference game against other teams, number one and two pitchers, they're hitting 212 with two home runs. So you have a better barometer to judge a college hitter because of all the different key elements involved with who they face. Um, high school hitters now with summer showcases are a little easier because they're, they're facing a little bit better pitching, but that's where you really have to go on athleticism, on bat speed, on strength. Um, you know, I have a, a, a son who's 28. He works for Seattle Mariners. He's been scouting for seven years. He was a 17-year-old high school senior at Boone County, and he was drafted in 2011, uh, signed to go to UC, and just said, Dad, I want to I want to play ball. Good high school hitting. I mean, just home runs, doubles, could really hit. Um, playing over here at Boone County High School, you know, very, very, very seldom faced a guy throwing mid-80s. And when he did, he handled – okay, but I knew he was going to struggle. Um, I didn't particularly want him to sign because I thought the three years of college, uh, summer ball, Cape Cod and all that would really help him. But he just said, no, I, I'm going to sign. And he went out and played and didn't have much success. Um, played for five years. Uh, got the A ball with the White Sox after he was traded from the Braves. But he just hadn't seen that type of pitching and especially on an everyday basis and either didn't get the time to adjust to it or just didn't have the ability to adjust to it. Um, you know, but it put him in a good position for a future position in baseball and all that stuff. So it is risky. Um, you know, and more and more people are doing it. And, you know, just like the thing we said before, people are, taking high school kids with the assumption that the upside is so much better. But again, I just, uh, you know, the upside might be a little bit better, but it's going to take him three or four years to get to the big leagues anyway. And for the good college hitter, he might be there in a year and a year and a half. So um, obviously, and, and that runs over into like the scouting in the Dominican Republic and Latin America where, you know, we're scouting and signing 13 and 14 year olds. It, it's 13 just and 14 year olds. Yeah. It's just insane. And, um, you know, but, but at times in order to, to get a commitment from a guy and from his uh, agent and from his trainer and his Buscone and all that, you have to do it to lock them up. Otherwise they'll go somewhere else. So the more, the more information you have, uh, the older a guy is, I think the more accurate you can be. So that, that leads me perfect into what I want to talk about next and, and ask you about next difference between scouting in, in Latin America, the, the Dominican Republic everywhere down there versus Americans, like the, even the same age is, are they more anything that's different about, scouting down there versus scouting up here, even if they are the same age from just an evaluation standpoint? Everything's different. Everything's different. Um, you know, you can go all the way back to one of the biggest things is nut nutrition and strength. Um, you know, the, the our Latin America director who has kind of taken me 
can train me a lot, even though I'm older than him, but he's been doing that longer. You know, he would tell me, you see a guy with a really, a 13 year old kid over there with a really, really bad complexion that that is basically due to lack of nutrition, lack of eating, lack of having the right nutrients and stuff in his body. So that has to be considered. Um, you know, when you're scouting a 13 or 14 year old, we typically scout high school and college guys who have reached, I don't want to say their maximum size and strength, but they're getting close, especially the college guys. So we don't project a running grade on a college player. If he runs 4-2 to first base, he runs 4-2, and that goes on my report. If a high school kid runs 4-4 four, four, and maybe he's a little thin, uh, maybe he doesn't have the best stride, you know, I might be able to say, you know, with certain running programs that he might get a little faster. Arm strength the same way. You know, a guy in high school and college, throw it across the infield, pretty much – Whatever they do then, what they're going to do in pro ball. With 13 and 14-year-olds, you're projecting everything. I mean, you see a guy run 4-7 in the first base, he might be running 4 flat in three years. You see a guy with a below-average arm uh, barely get it to first base from deep in the hole, much less have anything on it, he might have a plus arm when he gets to be 18 years old. So – there's so much more projection. Um, it's just really hard, and you have to make that commitment at such an early age. Um, I compare it most of the time to, let's say, an eighth grader or a freshman. If, if I had to pull the trigger on an eighth grader or a freshman in the States, and I had all those guys on paper, by the time they would be seniors in high school, my list would be absolutely turned upside down. Those guys that were the better players might not even still be playing baseball. The guys that were the best at this and the best of that, they may have gotten big. They may have gotten heavy. They may have just lost interest in the game. Over there, you have to make a decision on a, on a potentially age-wise an eighth grader or even a freshman and, and commit two, three, four million dollars to that guy that once he turned, you can actually sign him at 15. They can't play until they're 16. And you can keep them in Latin America for three years, three seasons. But you can get them committed whenever you want. And, and you know, people say, well, they get a lot better. They just break their commitment. Typically, they don't. Uh, when you break a commitment over there, that trainer, that owner, actually, they own the, the player, basically. You break a commitment with the team, the next team's not going to trust you to sign their guy. So, you know, the, you can commit to a 13-year-old over there that he's giving $4 million. By the time he gets to be ready to sign, you don't want to give him $4. You know, and at the same time, you can give a guy $40,000 over there and he turns into, uh, I'm just trying to think, one of the most recent guys, one of the most re recent Latin guys signed for 60000 and he's probably one of the top big league players. Um, you know, when we signed Fernando Tatis Jr., he wasn't a terribly big money guy. I think we gave him seven hundred, seven hundred fifty thousand dollars $750,000, which is a lot of money. But compared to some of the guys that got three and four and five million, um, you know, we lost Juan Soto over fifty thousand dollars. Over fifty thousand? Yeah, I think we were at one point two and somebody came along and gave him one point two five. Um, you know, and then you know, you say, Well, why didn't you get a one three? I mean, it's just it spirals from there. Uh, just like they have to live to their commitments, the team has to live to theirs. And when you start changing your figure on a player and he knows you're going to change it, they're just going to keep asking. But um, it's tough. It, it, it's tougher over there because of the age. 
uh, because of the facilities. Now, Major League Baseball is getting involved more and more and more every year. They're starting to hold showcases and, you know, taking wood bats over and better baseballs. But, I mean, you know, I can't tell you the number of times where I watch a kid take batting practice with, you know, you got somewhere where there were two trees about eight feet apart. and You tie a net to the two trees to be your batting screen and, and just hit the ball into the screen. You know, you just, there, there's a lot of things you're not able to do. The fields are, are typically subpar. Uh, the only real good things, and in, in especially the Dominican, is the, the minor league own complexes every every team's got a complex over there they're they're immaculate i mean the fields they'll typically have three or four fields they'll have a couple half fields they'll have a turf field so when it rains um you know training rooms dorms three you know meals a day so, uh, some of them actually border on being too nice uh, San Diego's got a place right on an ocean. They got a Olympic swimming pool there, um, but it's different. It, it's it's a lot different, and um, you know the players are good at an earlier age. I mean, it's like when I when I first started scouting in the early '80s, I was with the Cubs for ten years, and they would send me to South Florida or Texas. <clears throat> while the weather hadn't broken yet up here. And when I'd go to Miami and I'd watch a high school team take infield, it was like every player on this team would be a star on any player up here in Cincinnati or Northern Kentucky. I mean, they were polished. They could throw, they could feel their actions were great. Their feet were great, but they had been playing in warm weather area. They've been playing down there since they were eight years old or younger. Um, you know, we don't have that advantage up here in this part of the country, but uh, when it all comes down to it, we're not worried about how you play at eight or 12 or 16. We're worried about how you're playing when you're 22 and 24 years old. What is something that you see down at the, in the Dominican that you think would be beneficial for for players for Americans to to start doing in America, like for maybe from just a development standpoint or whatever it may be. Well, playing, yeah, just playing, throwing. You know, these kids they wake up at six o'clock in the morning to eat their breakfast. If they don't eat their breakfast, they don't get it. Um, they go out on the field and they throw, they run, they hit, they throw, they throw, they run, they hit. Uh, you know, then the, the, the organized instruction comes and they play the game after the game. You know, they'll eat lunch in between, they'll eat dinner, then they'll go out on the field, and run and stretch and throw. Uh, they just, they play so much more. Their arms are so much more highly developed. Um, and to be quite honest with you, they want it more. Um, and I don't know that you can ever train kids over here. I mean, you know, you take a kid over there, a pair of spikes or something. I mean, he'll love you and write you a letter every day the rest of your life. I mean, they, their appreciation for the game, but also their appreciation for things they don't have that they get. Um, you know, and it's, and it's sad to see sometimes, uh, that they just don't have that much. Now, again, sometimes that changes in a hurry. I mean, you know, Juan Soto is not really worried right now about somebody giving him a pair of spikes. <laughs> um, you know, so so there, there's just, I think, a desire. And part of that is, and the guys over there tell me this, because I would often go back to the front office and, suggest improvements for our facility you know hey maybe we need to add a couple hundred square feet to our training room or you know maybe we need to put air conditioning in their dorms because it's 100 degrees every day and it's 
90 degrees in their dorms when they're trying to sleep at night. But some of the older Dominican guys, some of the guys that have played, and some of the trainers that over there don't want it to be that nice. They want these kids to have the desire um, for 95% of it, their only chance to get off of that island is to play baseball. And they want them to still have that drive. So, you know, we've tried implementing enough that nutritionally with meals, uh, with training, you know, weight training, having doctors, having um, a medical staff, having a trainer, having proper equipment is paramount. You have to have it, but, you know, we've balked at having swimming pools and, you know, maybe fans instead of air conditioners and different things like that. So um, it's completely different. It really, really is. It's just the culture is so different. Um, oftentimes I'll hear clubs talk about, well, yeah, we're going to make Bill Smith that lives in New York, our Latin America coordinator. That don't work. That don't work. You need a guy who knows the culture, knows the language, knows the kids to be there and to be on the ground with them. Now, that doesn't mean he can't live in Miami or somewhere, but um, as we call him, to take a gringo over there and think that he can make it work, it, it just it, it can't work that way. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, Man, that's it's really interesting to hear you talk about what it's like down in Dominican, you hear different stories. Um, but man, I, I tell you what, Doug, I could, I could think I could have you on this podcast every week and I would never get bored listening to you talk about baseball and, and all your wisdom and experience that you've acquired, but we really appreciate you coming on today. It's been a ton of fun and, uh, man, anytime you want to come back on, you're more than welcome. Well, I'll tell you what, let's not make it every week, but but when you, when you got a spot you can't fill, maybe we can, maybe we can pick something specific or, you know, something else. And, uh, you know, I got plenty of time. And if I end up retiring here in December, I'm going to have a whole lot of time. So, okay. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate it, Doug. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you. All right. We'll see you. Bye-bye.